So good afternoon, uh, and thanks for inviting me to the uh, TEDx West. I'm going to um, have a, or make a plea to think in terms of um, you know, confronting the many societal problems we are facing today as working with wicked problems. And it's, an, it's at the same time, it's a kind of story that allows also you know, to, for, for me to think, to explain what the kind of work uh, is that we do. Um, uh, so I don't know whether it's, it's a term that is gaining wider currency, wicked problems. I don't know whether you're familiar with that. Who in here has uh, heard of this notion of wicked problems? A couple of people, not very many. Um, so what is it actually that we, that we were referring to when we're talking to about wicked problems? Well, let me first maybe take a step back. Um, and I'm not going to dwell a long time on this, on, this, on our current predicament, because I think that people here in the room are very aware of the many challenges and responsibilities that have befallen the human species in recent times. But scientists continue to tell us that recently we have entered the Anthropocene, which means that uh, the most decisive factor that shapes the fate of our planet is not uh, geologic, geological forces or climate, but it's decisions that are made by human beings. And obviously that comes with increased responsibility. We've seen those kinds of curves a lot lately, whether it's adoption of mobile phones or the uh, evolution of temperature of the, human, of the Earth's surface or global population, as we see here. You know, these kinds of curves, these kinds of hockey stick curves, suggest that we are faced with all kinds of uh, developments that are you know, non-linear and are spinning out of control. Um, of course, we're increasingly faced with issues that are not say local or region, regional or even on a national scale, but they are really kind of planetary scope. Um, connect, the, this, the connectivity, as I think, is something that over the last 15 years has shaped our environment in the most profound ways, and a lot of the talks at TED are about what the implications of this are. And then we are making our first baby steps, I would say, in trying to come to grips with this problem of you know, global governance. On top we have an image of the Treaty of Münster in the 17th century, which brought an end to the 30 years war and brought into being a new kind of political regime with the nation state at the center. And we have maybe 30 or 40 people in the room, you know, deciding or making these kinds of momentous decisions. Whilst below we have a picture from United Framework Convention on Climate Change, in Durban it was, you know, and there you have well, hundreds of delegates who are trying to you know, understand each other and make decisions about the kind of fate of the, of the planet in terms of dealing with climate change. And this is, has, not been, has not proved to be a very successful model, and clearly there's a lot of things that we have to learn in order to come to grips with those challenges. So, the question is then, you know, what, what, what does that mean? You know, that's, and I think we need to pause to ask ourselves that question because really, you know, when we are confronted with these kinds of phenomena, I think it's up to us to really make sense of that. And there's a, a variety of answers that are, that are possible uh, in response to that question, what does that mean? Um, it's maybe a little bit cursing in the church, you know, in the TED church, when I'm saying that I, I wouldn't qualify myself as a technological optimist, rather a technological realist, but one of the things that we tend to do is to think or hope that we can engineer our way out. I'm personally maybe not, not that uh, optimistic in that, in that respect. Um, there's other ways that we, tr we tend to deal with these kinds of naughty uh, problems, and Dirk Vermeer earlier, earlier he spoke about hot potatoes. Well, there's different ways we deal with those hot potatoes. Sometimes we just, you know, um, try to, you know, wipe the, the, the slate clean and, and, and do a revolution. Or we can go to back to first principles. You know, this is an image of Ron Paul, a constitutionalist in the United States. You know, once go back to you know the, found, the text of the founding fathers and nothing else. Or we try to bomb our way out. You know, these are all kind of possible responses. You know, to or to being con confronted with all these kinds of you know naughty uh, problems. But the kind of approach that I would uh, suggest is that we take time and take pause and. Uh, try and do an attempt to, you know, and I'm going to use a rather awkward phrase here maybe, to reconfigure the appreciative basis of our existence. What that means is actually that we try to step away from, 
you know, the urgency of the situation and try to um, revisit, re-examine our deepest held assumptions and actually redraw our own mental maps with uh, the goal actually to then, you know, uh, change the landscape, you know, in which we are operating. So it's actually redrawing the map in such a way that it changes the landscape. And I think this kind of image of the circular image of, of, of Escher um, expresses that quite well. And um, there's, a, there's, there's, there's a, a very venerable figure in the history of systems thinking, Sir Geoffrey Vickers, who once expressed that, I think, in a very, in a very, uh, uh, very well way, uh, when he said that, you know, we might, might look at all these challenges, you know, as a trap, as a, you know, as, as a challenge. But what is a trap? A trap is only a trap for creatures that cannot solve the problem that it sets. So the nature of the trap is a function of the nature of the trapped. So that is a challenge then, is, is really, you know, to reconceptualize, to reframe, you know, those issues in such a way that we really can, as a human species, get on top of that. And I think that the notion of a wicked problem offers a modest kind of possibility, a modest door into this, you know, process of reconceptualizing. It's not a novel process because actually the... Uh, the term wicked problem came into currency in the 1970s. In response, I think, it's, an, it's a hypothesis, of you know, many of the things that happened in those, well, what we tend to consider has the kind of you know, happy 1960s, you know, flower power and, uh, and those things, but actually was also a very turbulent period with a lot of social issues, uh, with a lot of you know, uh, armed conflict, and also the birth, actually, of the environmental movement goes back into those days. And it's actually quite useful to revisit the intellectual history uh, of the 1970s, you know, when a lot of thinkers came up with ideas and notions uh, that are still actually quite useful uh, uh, to read today. And this is just a kind of, a, you know, a sprinkle of books that appeared in the early or late 1960s, 1970s, many of them actually quite important in the history of systems thinking as well. And that is also when, in the 1973 paper, it was by an urban planner, Martin uh, Horstrittle and Martin Weber, they came up with this notion of a, a wicked problem. Wicked problems being, you know, planning problems that are ill-defined and reliant on political judgment. And at the same time, we saw other people like Don Schoen and Ross, Ross Ackhoff, you know, again, all people who played a fairly important role in this history of systems thinking with kind of similar issues. Now, the point I want to make is that um, I, I, I wouldn't like to suggest that, you know, out there, there are objective things we can point at and which, you know, are wicked problems, but I think it is useful to put on, so to speak, an analytical lens, special glasses that allow us to look at the world and the challenges we are faced with, you know, in terms of wicked problems. So that would mean that indeed, you know, up front, we would say that we are, uh, you know, willing to recognize unclear causalities. You know, that we are willing to say that, well, there is not way, one way to solve this issue, but there is no doubt there are many intervention points. Um, that we are willing to say that despite the abundance of all kinds of sensors and so on and so on, that data are scarce, that they are dispersed and low quality. That whatever we do, you know, it is very difficult to calculate what the cost is going to be, what the benefit is going to be of the intervention, that we recognize up front that, there are, that we are not the only one, you know, who are confronted with this issue, but there's no doubt there are more people that are, have a stake in it, and we can assume safely that they have a different look and a different stake on the issue, and so that there might be incompatibility between worldviews. And so, you know, the defining a problem is not an issue of saying, you know, this is where we draw the box where the problem is in, but it's more a process of, you know, continuously reframing and renegotiating of what a problem might be. You know, renegotiating between different parties who have different views and maybe incompatible views on the issue. And so looking at the world in terms of wicked problems would also mean that we recognize upfront that optimality you know, from an engineering point of view, doesn't exist. And that also, there may be path dependency. So that we take it, when we gamble, you know, as Dirk earlier said, there's a cost to it. You know, we have to be aware that by taking certain options, we close off other possibilities. 
You know, that's all involved in working with wicked problems. And even today, people talk about super wicked problems. You know, climate change, for example, we might uh, consider to be a super wicked problem because you know, the scope is exceptionally large and the potential downside is also large. Um, those responsible for it have the least interest in doing something about it. And the longer we wait, the more wicked it gets. So that's an appeal um, to work with wicked problems. Now, uh, let's say, from a consultancy point of view, you might say, you know, that's the ultimate sales pitch, you know. We're not even selling solutions anymore. You know, we're selling non-solutions. Well, maybe. But the thing is that we're actually making our lives more difficult uh, by, by, by doing this, you know, by recognizing issues as wicked problems. Because from my point of view and in my experience, there's actually three ways, well, three ways, at least, you know, three ways or traditions almost, you know, to grapple with complexity that we need to bring together in order to work with uh, these wicked issues. And um, I would uh, qualify them as respectively, you know, the world of abstract ideas and more specifically of systems thinking. I think, the, you know, the world or the practice of dialogue is an important one, and then the, act, the practice of design. And actually, honestly, you know, I, I, before I came here today, I didn't actually, you know, of course I heard about TED, but I didn't know what the T, E, and D stood for. Uh, now I know it's technology, entertainment, and design, but there's an, maybe an interesting correspondence here, the technology being, you know, you know, the kind of soft technology of the systems thinking, um, the D of design, of course, and the E wouldn't be uh, entertainment, but rather encounter, you know, where we encounter the other person and engage into the true dialogue. So why these three, these three kind of disciplines? Um, you know, I think we all have to acknowledge that we cannot solve, you know, all these kinds of wicked issues, whatever they are, whether it's climate change or obesity or you, you name it, you know, by sitting behind our desks and thinking as engineers. But still, I think we shouldn't throw out, you know, the, kid, the child with the bathwater. I think the world of abstract ideas and of systems thinking can offer us a lot. Particularly systems thinking because it's a discipline that learns us to think in terms of the big picture, you know, the whole system. It's a, it learns us to think in terms of relationships, particularly between organizations or entities or whatever it is and its environment. Incidentally, there is a quote in the program book uh, below the program, which is uh, from it's a Kevin Kelly quote, which I really cannot make sense of. You know, it says that, systemically speaking, it is impossible to make a distinction between an organization and its environment. I think that's absolutely wrong because it's one of the fundamental principles of systems thinking that this boundary between organization and or entity and its environment is drawn. That's, that's, that's where systems thinking starts, you know, with its advantages and disadvantages, of course. Um, systems thinking is also about thinking dynamics. It's about understanding, you know, behavior over time. And, you know, in many ways, in particular ways of practicing, practicing systems thinking, it's also what we call working with boundary judgments. And that's going back to the, f the recognition that it's not us only who are likely involved with an issue, but that there's more people involved, and that we have to be very conscious how we define a problem, how we draw that line between, say, entity and environment, or problem and non-problem. And so that was, that's what we call, in critical systems thinking, boundary judgments. Dialogue is actually an exercise in empathy. So I'm not talking about simply debate or discussion, but the kind of you know, genuine you know, exchange, as for example, described by David Bohm, uh, as an exercise in empathy, as also a cultivation of, of contingency, because you likely all have a, that experience that when you engage in deep debate, you know, there's something unexpected happens. You know, it's never possible to almost predict where a conversation is going. You know, it meanders in the most unpredictable ways. And in dealing with, you know, complexity, that is often very useful. You know, it's the kind of gambling or experimentation that we bring into this, uh, into this way of, of dealing with it. And of course, it's also about building social capital, building relationships. And then design. Design is, is from my point of view, you know, I'm, I was trained originally as an engineer, and um, I must say I've been working a lot with designers, both urban designers and product designers, and it's been a revelation to see how these people you know, deal with complexity. Um, what I've always found fascinating is that from day one, you know, for example, when you have urban designers and they tackle a big issue, you know, on a territorial scale and 
and uh, with, uh, con concerning or affecting millions of people, you know, from day one, you know, they just start to make sketches and draw and so on and so on. So they start to work in a solution-oriented way from day one. I think that's very impressive. Uh, I think there's an enormous power in that. Uh, you know, and that is a contrast to the systems thinkers who are actually trying to, uh, you know, understand everything and analyze uh, everything. Um, it's, a, it's an example of abductive thinking, so it's associative, and it's also being able, you know, to, gener to generate visual representations of what might be. Now, I'm not going to dwell uh, a, l a lot on these kinds of things, you know, but there are a lot of methodologies, there's a lot of approaches that have been developed that bring those three things together and that we use in our work. Um, so that bring together dialogue, design, and designedly approaches and systems thinking. And I don't think I have the time to dwell on this and go very deeply into this, but you know, we work a lot with soft systems methodology. Adaptive management is a technique that has been developed by ecologists in order to you know, kind of manage, so to speak, you know, complex systems such as ecosystems. Today, many people talk about transition management, so when we want to, you know, steer, and again, it's an almost an oxymoron, you know, to talk about management when we talk about transition, transitioning complex socio-technical systems like mobility and healthcare towards more sustainability. It's actually, you know, a very clever way of bringing together kind of experimentation, a kind of broad visions, and then the capability to, an ongoing, to sustain an ongoing learning process. Um, scenario planning has been around for a long time, but it's a kind of a discipline that continues to evolve and that is drawing in uh, those, you know, different disciplines that I mentioned, the designerly approaches. The um, dialogue has been at the heart of scenario planning from the very beginning, but it is something you, you do not behind your desk, but with other people. And then the design thinking, which has been very prominent in the last couple of years, that too, you know, brings together in, some, in a particular way these different ways of dealing uh, with wicked problems. And I think, you know, we need to broaden our repertoire um, considerably beyond, you know, also the, the examples I've given here, and maybe the traveling again, you know, that Dirk Vermeer advocated, there's another way of, of doing that. Um, it's not only a, a matter of technical expertise and knowledge, I think it's also a matter of being. It's a, it's a matter of, you know, being in a certain way and looking at the, at the world in a particular way. Um, and so there's a particular ethos involved. And here I'm referring actually to uh, an ethos that uh, Peter Block in his book, The Answer to How is Yes, explained. And he said, you know, when you really want to change things, you know, you have to actually internalize or develop uh, three key capabilities or three key, key competencies. And one, he says, is the competency for depth, which means a capacity for reflexivity, and the courage to, exam to examine our own assumptions. And I would, I would associate that with the ability to, to do systems thinking. Second capacity or capability in order to you know, really change things in the world is intimacy. And that's the capacity for careful observation and the courage to surrender to the empathy. And I would make an obvious connection there with the practice of, of dialogue. And then the third one is, the, is idealism. And that I would naturally associate with design and design kind of designedly approaches, because that's about the willingness to go for our ideals beyond what we can consider to be really practical. And it's the, the courage to take up, you know, to go for freedom, so to speak. So that's what I wanted to say about uh, working with wicked problems. There's a publication I've recently written in, uh, in at, re at a request of the King Baudouin Foundation, which can be downloaded and which tells a lot more than I was able to synthesize in this brief contribution. Thank you very much.